Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Spartan Forge. On today's episode, I am joined by Dr. Carl Miller and Chris Derrick of Sika Gear. We discuss the expansion and growth of ticks and tick-borne illnesses across the U.S. and more importantly, how to prevent ticks. This led to the reason behind the design of the new Sika Equinox Turkey Gear Collection that I was lucky enough to be able to test last year. On this week's episode, Mountain Buck Monday Story of the Week comes from Dalton Gordon. And this is not the first time that Dalton has sent in a story. It might be his third year in a row with some beautiful Southwest Virginia mountain bucks. So his story goes, another Southwest Virginia mountain buck in the books. I have put in more time and miles this past year than any other year and felt like I was walking backwards most of the time. But you have to have bad luck to have good luck. Patience and persistence is the best advice I can give anyone chasing these public land deer especially in this part of the States. It just feels good. And I don't disagree with that at all, Dalton. Awesome buck. Anyone who wants to check it out, head over to East Meets West Hunt on Instagram and East Meets West Outdoors on Facebook. Take a look at Dalton's photo. Uh, If you want to be entered to have your story in the Mountain Buck Mondays, send it in to Bo at eastmeetswesthunt.com or just fill out the contact us form at eastmeetswesthunt.com. All right, so uh, this week, I this, actually this past weekend, we had some really nice weather here in northern Pennsylvania, and I got out scouting a lot. Uh, I spent most of the weekend, although I had a lot of other work to do, I <laughs> spent most of the weekend out in the woods, and it felt great. I think I, uh, I pulled like 18 cameras that I had out, which was like Christmas, getting to go through those cards and and ended up picking up about three sheds along the way. Just awesome, awesome time to get out in the woods and check it. Had some really cool footage and things that I learned. Uh, just I learned so much from these cameras, especially running them almost year round. And and you know, a couple of the spots were really good in rifle season and late season in January. I had some does being chased around by bucks in January and just like some things that you just continually start to learn and see more and leaving these cameras up for extended periods of time just really helps me learn all that stuff but anyways I had a really cool video of a coyote howling on my camera and you can hear it clear as day it was on one of my exodus cameras I uh, posted the video um, just over my personal Instagram, just my name, Bo Martonic, and same on Facebook. But I posted them over there. I'm probably going to put it up on YouTube too. It's just such a cool video of I've never had one howling in front of the camera. So uh, if you get a chance, check that out. But uh, I'm really excited to to get this podcast out here. It's been a while since I was able to get together with both Dr. Carl Miller and Chris Derrick. Uh, just I, I love talking to these guys, great people, and uh, really excited for this episode as we start getting into the warmer weather. Ticks are out. I think uh, I think this will be a good one. So thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating and a review. It helps out a lot. Share it with your friends. Have a good rest of your week. All right, we're live. So welcome back to the show. I got Chris Derrick from Sick of Gear, and I have Dr. Carl Miller, who's back, and and he's been, I guess, retired since the last time that I talked to him. So it's good to have you back, guys. Uh, great to be here. Glad yeah. to be here. Yeah. it's um, Last time the three of us were together, we were hunting in Ohio at Latitudes, doing some testing of gear in like January, I think. Yeah, it was a, that was a lot of fun, and it's always a good time there. So, and it was uh, faster than our public, faster pace than our public land experience. And uh, when you and I hunted together in the stopping grounds. Well, it's funny because Carl's, you know, from the area that that 
I'm from in Pennsylvania, so he understands a little bit, but getting to bring Chris into hunting some of the, the big woods here in, in PA was a little bit, not, not as many deer sightings, I guess, as, as you saw. No, Ohio. but I want to come back. That's yeah. but I'm coming back for sure. So good. So Carl, what, a what, so for anybody that hasn't listened, first of all, I will say that if anybody hasn't listened, you need to go back to listen to the podcast that did with Carl. It was in Jan, or I think it released in like June of 2020 or something like that. Yeah, I can't remember something around those dates, but you need to go back and listen to that one. It's actually one of the, my most downloaded podcasts that, that I've ever done, Carl. So really? yeah, yeah. People like to hear you talk. You uh, <laughs> have a lot of knowledge. So if, if, but, but if people haven't uh, checked that out yet, would you mind giving a little, uh, a brief background on your wide range of knowledge that you have and, and I guess what you've done. Oh, good guy. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting old now. So there's a lot of thing, a lot of water under the bridge. Um, I've been at the university of Georgia. I came here to, to work on my PhD in the early eighties, finished that up in the mid eighties. And I was hired on since then and basically ran the deer program motor, the good part of the deer program, but here for 34 years before, before I retired, I position was about 50% research and 50% teaching. So I spent time teaching forest management for wildlife and, and, you know, wildlife courses. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of the work I did was on deer. We did a lot of work on deer management, deer physiology. Uh, we were really highly involved in the, the, the start of the, the concept of quality deer management here. Uh, we were, we were part of that movement as well. But I think some of the stuff we've been most notable for is our work with uh, deer sensory perception how well deer hear and see, how they experience the world. Because my interest was I wanted to find out what deer knew, what they could figure out so I could kill them better. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, that's, um, yeah, that's exactly what we had talked about in that the last time that we did the episode there. And uh, it was it was great because you, you had a way of, you obviously um, have a lot deeper knowledge and understanding than just about anybody else on it, but you're able to put it out there in a way that was easily digestible, I guess, for the rest of us. So, <laughs> well, it hasn't translated into making them any any easier for me to kill, though. That hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I guess yeah. That's a a lifetime of of working towards that goal, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess if it was easy for I guess if it was easy for all of us, then uh, we probably wouldn't do it. So it wouldn't be fun, would it? No. All the chase. Uh, yeah. So Chris, how about you give a little bit of a background? You've been on the podcast probably I don't know half a dozen times by now, if not more. But uh, just give a brief background yourself. Yeah, um, I uh, work at uh, Sitka Gear, and um, you know I mainly work on the Whitetail product line. So anything that you see, uh, usually an elevated two, uh, having to do with the pursuit of whitetail. Um, you know, I've been hunting for, you know, since my early teen years, uh, my entire life. And, you know, I've always been involved in the outdoor industry. I, I used to work for Pure Fishing, which owns like 17 fishing brands. So, um, you know, and 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 I, I uh, came on board uh, a number of years ago uh, for Sika Gear to take over the whitetail line and, and that's when I first met Bo. I think that was back in uh, 2017. So yeah, yeah, it's been it's been a few years. It's it's kind of funny how long that's been, and and we've hunted together a number of times and worked on a whole bunch of projects and stuff. That uh, yeah, it's been it's been a ride. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. So I um I have both of you guys on here um, for a reason to talk about a few things. Um, one of them being uh, the launch of the, the new Sika Turkey hunting gear um, for Chris. But before we kind of go into that, there's something I want to lead lead everything into, and and it, it you'll see at the end why it kind of ties in. But so ticks and well, ticks really are like the main focus point is something that. Is, is a topic that's important to me is I have Lyme disease that, uh, that I got about 10 years ago or so now and has led to a whole bunch of other problems with me personally. And just so happened to find out the Jack of all trades, Dr. Carl Miller over here knows a little bit about them. So I, so Carl, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about, um, 
ticks and specifically why ticks what what's changed you know in in the last i don't know 15 20 years or so uh with with ticks and why they're so prevalent now yeah thanks but you know this this is actually a topic that's actually becoming more and more important to me as as i as i get older and think about it more because you know as hunters we spend a lot of time a lot of effort making sure that hunting experiences are safe for hunters uh, we give hunter safety courses. We have use blaze orange. We, there's so much stuff we do to, to maximize hunter safety when they're out in the field. But I think this is one area that has been very, very poorly neglected. And that the idea of personal safety when it comes to protecting yourself from tick-borne or, or mosquito-borne types of diseases, because things are different now than they were 20 years ago. And they're not going to get any better. They're going to continue to get worse. When I grew up, you know, up in northern Pennsylvania, where you're, both you and I are from, as a young kid running through those mountains, in, in you know, I don't think in my entire time that I was there for, you know, until I was 20 some years old, I ever saw a tick. They just weren't there. And now they're everywhere. And Lyme's disease, it's, you know, th- those counties up there are listed as high, high risk counties for Lyme's disease. You said you've had it, right? Yep. Every, yeah, just about everybody in my family has. Right. Let me let me just read you a couple of figures that I that I put together for you. Okay. That some the diseases from mosquitoes and ticks have tripled in the 13 years between 2004 and 2016. That's the number of cases that have been reported. They've tripled. Um, diseases from from ticks themselves have tripled since the 1990s. In 2017, there were 59,000 cases of Lyme's disease or tick-borne diseases reported to the CDC. Now, that's enough. That doesn't sound like much, but that's the reported case. Yeah. The actual number is probably 10 times that. The CDC says it's underreported by that rate, so it's 10 times that. So we're talking somewhere around a half a million cases a year. That is incredible numbers of them. You know, the, num- the numbers of cases of Lyme's disease alone may be 300,000 or more. Yeah. year God, and you know you think you know it's a high risk situation going out in the woods in the last seven years there have been six new tick-borne diseases identified in the, in this country in just the last two decades you, you know i i was wondering sorry i don't mean to cut you off but like i feel like i've been seeing more like tick-borne illnesses pop up i'm like are these like are these real or where are these coming from it just seems like that i don't know my dad just sent me an article again on or just like i don't know it's probably three or four days ago now about the deer tick virus um that supposedly was found in, in you know in parts of pennsylvania here and and just like all these different things that are coming from ticks and it just kind of blows my mind Right. You know, here, here it is. There's there's right now there's 16 of them recognized different diseases you can get from ticks. And they're more, different ones are more prevalent in different parts of the country. The Northeast has the Lyme's disease and we have Rocky Mountain spotted fever and others down here. Um, and you know, the number of new ones uh, that are being identified, that's because we got new techniques to identify them and people are more aware of them. So they're reporting them more more frequently as well. But uh, it, not only that, the numbers themselves are actually increasing as well, because the vector, the ticks themselves, have been expanding their range. The, the, the deer tick, the black-legged tick that's so common up there, I mean, almost year-round up in Pennsylvania and throughout the Northeast, as soon as, you know, above 30 degrees outside, the number of counties that are considered high risk for Lyme disease has increased like 300 percent in the last couple of decades. In counties like Elk County and, you know, Powder County, Cameron County, where we're from, there were no ticks there, so there was no Lyme disease, and now it's considered a high-risk county. The same thing with the Lone Star tick here in the south. Its range has expanded north and westward. So as deer populations expand, as deer move into, particularly as deer move into rural communities and, or even urban communities and expose more people to the tick-borne illnesses, these numbers are going to continue to decrease. That's so that's why it's so important to, to to protect yourself from these things. Yeah, and is there is there any way of like of stopping that expansion? Maybe that sounds crazy, but like is there is there any thought thought process behind that, or is it more of just a prevention side of things rather than than 
I, I have no idea. I'm just throwing this out there. Right, right. That's a that's a great <laughs> question. Right now, obviously, right now, it's, it's just keep the ticks off, you know, as best you can. Yeah. But I actually just saw a paper the other day where there's a group in Texas working to develop a vaccine that 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 can be administered to deer that will def, that will uh, immunize them basically against ticks. Hmm. Now, how would, how you would get that vaccine to wild wild deer is a, is another situation, yeah. you know. But you know how how we can t- control ticks in wild, you know, big woods areas. You know, that's that's going to be a very di- difficult situation. That could so be kind, kind of, of fun. We're, we're, that could be fun to try to, like, you know, you go out there with a like a bow in the summer that's got like this little tick zapper on the end of it, and you shoot it. It's like a dart, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you know, there is one possibility. They they do give out vac- vaccines to raccoons for rabies, so. You know, yeah. and that's done by airplane. So th- there are possibilities. But when you're talking half a million people getting these diseases every year, that's that's pretty. In- when you compare that to COVID. Yeah. Yeah, I think Bo's also just looking for excuse to be able to hunt deer. But then <laughs> he's back there and he just he shoots. And he's like, yep, vaccinated. Yep. Vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd, I'd love to be the vaccinator of deer. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I mean, it's, that's a, it's a scary, it's a really, really scary thing to think about. And like, I I just know, like from, from myself, like with, with having Lyme's disease and, and I didn't find out I had it until, I don't know, they were, my doctor assumed I've had it for at least a year by the time that I found out I was just having all these issues and I ended up Mm -hmm. developing, um, I ended up developing a bunch of different food allergies that were, that they were saying it was linked back to having Lyme's disease and having joint pain and all these different things that just kind of just, uh, you know, rolled over and, and, uh, spitballed a little bit, but it was, um, I I just, and I see how it affects everybody differently. And, and just these, these tick borne illnesses. I mean, I was at a point where I was getting so many ticks on me all the time that I never, if, if I was in the woods and wasn't pulling one out of me or a couple off of me, like it's just, that's just what it was, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's so unusual compared to how it was, you know, my whole family basically have had it too. I've had, I haven't had Lyme disease because it's not as prevalent down here, but I had uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I've had ehrlichiosis, which is very, you know, another one that's very similar. My son has been diagnosed with the Lyme disease, but it was probably a something related to Lyme disease called star eye. I even had a coon dog at the time that got Lyme disease. Really? Yeah, and he, he could he got to where he couldn't stand up on his tree be, because his hips hurt him so bad. Jeez! So I took him to the vet and had and he got diagnosed as Lyme's disease, and after that he was fine. He got treated for it. Really? So I I guess um, there's a couple different ways I could take this right now, but I guess the first thing is uh, this is I have a question. Do Do you know much about like as far as the treatment of Lyme's disease? Um, about the different forms of treatment and any thoughts on on that those forms of treatment? You know that there. I know there's a, a lot of them. Most of them are either a tet, you know tetracycline or doxycycline based treatments. I don't know as much about Lyme's disease because we that's not prevalent down here. Mm-hmm. But you know the the ones that we have down here, like star eye and ehrlichiosis, uh, are are very fairly easily treated with doxycycline. And we I actually keep some on hand. I probably shouldn't say this on a podcast, but I keep some. <laughs> <laughs> but you know if if i ever or any of my family comes down with you know a summertime flu you know just some prophylactic doxycycline just in case you know because a, a summertime flu could just as easily be you know something related to a tick disease as well as the, a flu bug yeah and and what about have, have you heard anything about like parasite zappers like the like it's almost like it's, <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Like where you hold on to the, the, it sounds really quacky and it might be, but I, that's the treatment that my doctor had me go through rather than taking any sort of medication. And she likes to do a little bit of like non-traditional type stuff. And Mm -hmm. I didn't have any issues after I went through it with with the Lyme disease other than, cause it was, it was so late on, I already had some of the, the initial 
things, but I had to do it for it like two days on. Again, I'm not the right person to talk about this. Uh, I should have did a lot more research before I came on and started talking about it. But like it basically supposedly like runs electricity through your body and you're holding on to these two handles and you don't feel anything. It almost feels like nothing's happening, but you do it for like an hour and then the next day it goes in to kill the, the eggs. So you do it again the next day. And then you wait a day and then you go in and treat again just to make sure you got it all. And it's supposed to like just zap any parasites from your body. I don't know. I just, uh, I didn't know if you'd heard anything of it. <laughs> uh, no. So, <laughs> so maybe, hey, maybe it's all if in my it head. <laughs> if but, it works, it works, right? Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I've brought that up to like quite a few people and nobody's ever heard of it, but. I don't know. It's, uh, it felt like it's worked for, for me and some of my family members. So, but when I, I usually don't say that publicly because it sounds, as soon as I start talking, I'm like, man, I, I don't, don't sound extremely intelligent. Okay, though. My wife has them too. So, oh, does she really yeah. see? There we go. She has an yeah. Autoimmune, so yeah. So they tried the same thing with her. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. But, um, kind of T- tasing the bugs, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just tasing the bugs. <laughs> but so what? what's the difference between like, say, um, like Lyme disease and like Rocky Mountains uh, spotted fever? Like what are some of the, the symptoms of some of those things for people to be able to, to bring it up? Do you know that off the top of your head? Um, you know, both, both of them are probably, those are probably two of the, the, the most prevalent, but also two of, and, and put a third one in there called anaplasmosis, uh, the most prevalent, but uh, you know, obviously with Lyme's disease, the bullseye rash is the dead giveaway. Um, but Rocky Mountain spotted fever can sometimes mimic that as well. And there's another one down in the south called star eye that is very similar to um, uh, Lyme's disease. So all of these have a very sim- similar type of uh, manifestation. Um, the, the, you know, the, the summertime fever, the sweats, particularly at night, uh, joint pain. Uh, lethargy, um, along with uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, there's actually a, a rash is typically associated with that. Now, I was told I had I have titers for Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but I I never had the manifestation of the disease, so I never did get that. You know, but but you know they say that Rocky Mountain spotted fever can be deadly as well, so that's a that's a serious one to be concerned about. Yeah, uh, but it usually usually it does develop a rash that's very symptomatic. So, have you have you heard anything about the the deer tick virus that that I've read about in the news specifically in Pennsylvania or have you heard that term before? No, I haven't heard the deer tick virus. I don't know which one what virus they're actually talking about. Are you talking about? about the one where you can't eat meat? No. Isn't that the oh, Okay. That's been the one that like it seems like a lot of people I've talked to haven't really like they're like oh yeah Lyme disease blah 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 can't eat meat and all of a sudden it was like everybody yeah like, everybody's yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're gonna we're actually going to talk about that one here in a minute because that's a different that's not a disease that's a syndrome but it's called alpha gal okay. and let's get we'll get to that one keep, keep that on in mind because that's a, that's an interesting one because i'm sure you don't want that one either no but okay so back on the deer tick virus is considered a, a powa maybe okay Powassan virus. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, a Powassan virus. Yeah, it right. basically you can develop severe neuroinvasive um, issues with it, and it says like you can you can be it can be transmitted from a tick to a human as little as fifteen minutes after the bite occurs, and which is crazy. You know, with Lyme's disease, typically taking twenty four hours or more from what that at least from what I've read there, and. And like, and there was, they were a sample. There was like eleven or twelve percent of people were dying from this virus that got it. And and just in this area and Pennsylvania alone, there was like uh, twenty three out of twenty five sampled ticks in one specific location were positive for that for the what they call the deer tick virus, which is pretty incredible and they'd never seen those kind of numbers or seen that in uh, Pennsylvania before. Yeah. It, it's pretty well confined from what I understand the Powassan virus to the great lakes region and into the Northeast as well. And, but you're all right. It does cause a neurological symptoms, a meningitis. Yeah. As well. 
Okay. Well, at least it's only in this area. You're fine down there, Carl. <laughs> yeah, so far. <laughs> um, no. Yeah, but- you got we got ones that are fairly easy to take care of with drugs. Yours, like Lyme's disease, is pretty difficult. You know, if, if you if you don't get it treated right away, uh, you, you get long Lyme. What what long Lyme's disease or chronic? <laughs> yeah. And so, what was what was the other one you're talking about? The one of the, the virus about not being able to meet. Oh, it's not. That's not a virus. That's a, That's or, another sorry. syndrome. <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> and it's 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 tends to be a little more confined to the the, the east coast and the southeast. Uh, the worst the worst cases of it are through Virginia, North Carolina, into Georgia, and so forth, down into Florida. But there is a type of sugar called. Uh, Galactose, two alpha galactose, I think, or they call it alpha gal. Um, but it, it occurs in red meats, but not in fish, and but not in humans. But when a tick trans, you know, tick takes a, takes a bite of this and that, you know, of of, a, of of some species out there, it actually will ingest some of this uh, alpha gal, and then when it bites into a human. Uh, in a subsequent meal, when a tick first takes its bite, it's actually injecting part of its saliva into there as an anticoagulant. And that also injects some of this par- carbohydrate, which s- triggers the, the host immune system to react to this sugar that's found in red meat. And in a select su- group of people, that end up, ends up giving them an allergy to en- eating any type of red meat. And, you know, I've had students, I have one graduate student that had it. I've known a number of people that had this thing. And, you know, that's a terrible thing for a hunter to go through. Oh, be terrible. end up where you, you know, you end up with rashes. I mean, just you know, could, could actually get in a severe case going to anaphylactic shock over this stuff. Uh, so just, just from eating red meat or anything associated with red meat. Um, and the number, you know, that was only first diagnosed, I think, 10 to 15 years ago. And now they're, you know, they, they say that there's over 5,000 cases. I think the number of cases is very under reported as that as well. It's much more prevalent than people think it is, but what, what a sentence that would be to a hunter to not be able to eat red meat again. No, I'd be, I'd be super passionate about putting that vaccine out there at that point, okay. getting that vaccine in the deer. <laughs> now, you're, you're, the person's reaction depends on a person's immune system, right? Really. Yeah. And and the graduate student I had, he went cold turkey off anything that had to do with it, and actually he uh, basically, or after about a year, he got over it. Really? And he was able to, he was able to try red meat again, but a lot of people don't. That's crazy. That would be so, a- you know here here we here we are without you know all these kinds of ticks. The the populations of ticks are increasing, and their range is expanding. And, you know, each, you know, the, the, the Yankee ticks are moving south and the southern ticks are moving north and the diseases they carry are going with them. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one one way of putting it. There'll be a, a battle in the center somewhere. But uh, yeah, poor West Virginia, right? Yeah. Poor West Virginia. <laughs> 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 and so and, and Carl, one thing you had uh, you had also mentioned, I don't remember if we I think it was before we actually started recording, but you were talking about um, mosquito illnesses, which is something that's not thought about a whole lot. I know that uh, in early season, um, sometimes you're in Pennsylvania, I'm sure in the South and and no experience that even in like Alaska and stuff of mosquitoes. And do you want to talk a little bit about them? Yeah. You know, for most hunters, Mosquitoes are probably more of a nuisance than anything, but, you know, be aware that there are some uh, diseases that they carry as well. And you're probably f- familiar with just a couple of years ago, we had Zika, that virus that became very prevalent, uh, you know, and it kind of disappeared. But there are a number of other ones. Another new one was called chikagunya. Uh, it's another uh, mosquito-borne illness. But there's another, a couple others like West Niles virus uh, and, you know, some uh uh, encephalitis virus, St. Louis encephalitis. So there, there are things that you can catch from mosquitoes as well. So, you know, protecting yourself from those as well. Yeah, that's pretty tough down here in the South, particularly when you're hunting down in the swamps, right? Uh, so anything you can do to, to minimize the number of mosquito strikes you get, uh, you're probably beneficial to you. Yeah. So 
is so let's let's kind of move a little bit to that direction the prevention of all these things as you said we can't stop it apparently as of now there's no there's no good feasible way to be able to stop this as far as like the expansion of ticks or, or anything along those lines so we have to be able to prevent it so talk about some different ways that you can prevent um ticks from or ticks or mosquitoes or anything like that uh you know, obviously, uh, being very di- diligent with uh, inspecting yourself after you've been in the woods uh, is probably the number one, just to make sure you don't have those 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 critters hanging on you. But they seem to find a way to get in places where you don't typically inspect, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that um, being very careful about what you're wearing as far as clothing, tucking, tucking in your sleeves, your boots, uh, anything like that. Uh, any types of repellents, permanent, et cetera, those types of things are very important as well. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, Chris is going to talk about some of their new stuff that they've got coming out that's, you know, is it would is outstanding as far as controlling ticks and mosquitoes. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, it's funny, like the, the whole tucking in, like, you know, your clothing and stuff. I always remember, like, as a kid and even still, if I'm like, I feel like when I'm around my dad, like it's in the summertime or it's warmer weather, he's always like tuck, tuck, tuck his pants and do his boots and his socks, and, like have everything like because it uh, ticks. And I'd be like, what do you look like? Oh, an idiot dad like what are you doing you know? and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> but he he knew what he was doing from that standpoint you know and I'll, always was like drilled into my head because um you know as as ticks were starting to become more prevalent as i was growing up you know it's like always check for ticks always check for ticks when you get back before you go in the house before you you know do anything is check for ticks and um so what, what were you saying as far as some of the the sprays there or anything that you can treat your your clothes with yeah, I'll, I'll, there, there's a lot of types of insect repellents, you know, that you can use out there. You, you know, permanent is by far, I, I guess, one of the most common ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, so, you know, anything with, with permanent or, or any of the pyrethroids in it that are, you know, that you, you see very commonly as, as far as tick repellents, they do work. Hmm. And so, so Chris, let's, uh, let's, move a little bit to what uh what carl was alluding to there with you know some of the some of the sick of pieces being i guess talk, talk a little bit about that with the insect yeah field. so i mean it's just really interesting like hearing you guys talk talk about this um for me this was like a big personal passion just solving it because like every case that you guys were just talking to was just like this like i have friends too right here that are my good friends both of you guys have had encounters with this and every person I would talk to would either know somebody or have had a tick-borne illness themselves uh, and could relate to this. My own daughter had Lyme disease. So what we were talking about, like, I mean, she got, we found the bullseye, but it was in a spot that nobody was looking obviously. And then she's six years old and she's like, what's this? And we look and then, you know, you got the red dot already showing and everything. So you know, for me, it was just solving this was something that I knew was going to make people's lives better in the field because we're out all the time. It's just like when I would go out, like especially in South Carolina, I lived there every single time I would go out, I pull tick off, ticks off of me. They may not have been locked on, but I was pulling them off. And so but I wanted to make it comfortable enough for people and lightweight enough. So there's a lot of solutions like we were talking about there. Like one is DEET, Right. And, you know, like DEET, you have to be very cautious about just putting the rings around where they first encounter you, you know, maybe put it around your wrist, put it around your socks, something along those lines and, and areas like that. Then there was other solutions that were like where you might have to wear an extra layer of clothing. Well, it's 95 degrees. I don't want to wear an, two layers of clothing. I want I want to be comfortable. There's other ones, you know, where they're 3D mesh that they say work, but they're all so bulky. You couldn't shoot a bow. You couldn't shoot anything with it. Uh, you know, face masks, all those things. And then, you know, Thermosil, I love, you know, it's a great, great product, but it does smell. And that's one of the things I'm pretty conscious we all are of the whitetail woods. So all of them had some sort of a drawback. And I wanted to develop a solution that basically solved that and gave you reasonable protection. So like Carl said, using it in the right way. So when we, we developed what we're calling the Equinox Guard. So 
basically equinox being the, between the two equinoxes, you know, the, those warm parts of the years and, and that, um, and, and then having a guard and protecting you. And that's kind of how we came up with a name for it, but it's all about giving you reasonable prevention. So I, I keep bees myself. Like you, you like, I'm not going to say I'm going to stop a hundred percent of your mosquito bites, but I'm going to greatly reduce it. So with the, like the, this, like the hoodie, for example, we're coming out with, like I, I went out here in Montana in a spring bear hunt with my wife. We sat down over like a kind of a low wet area and we're waiting. I'm thinking I'm in Montana now. I don't really, I'm not going to run into a bad mosquito case. You know, it's not going to be a bad deal. Well, we, we got annihilated. And we were wearing like, you know, our regular base layers tops because it was really hot. And so she and I went back to the same area a couple of days later with the prototypes that we had zero bites. Like I've talked to people like, I mean, usually like I've, I've places where I take 40 or 50 mosquito bites. I'm taking one. And the, and, and so I guess it would make sense since we were talking about mosquitoes to talk about the hoodie. So it's, it's really in all the textile we developed. So I worked with our textile engineer at Gore and we wanted to develop a really lightweight textile. And this thing's like, I mean, this textile is like as light as the core lightweight hoodie, if not lighter. So, and, but there's only a few specialized machines out there can, that can knit such a high gauge knit with the type of materials we're doing. So we would, we would take a bunch of different textiles and knit them with these. And then we work with a third party lab, Snell Scientific, that's actually based in Georgia. And what we did is we would release 20 female mosquitoes into like a cage with a heated blood membrane. So they basically take blood, they heat it up to the, like the human temperature, and then they will put it over like a sleeve and then drop it into the cage with the mosquitoes. And you do that with a control textile that you know they can feed through and then all the different textiles you want to test. And then basically you let them sit in there for 20 minutes, you freeze them, drop them in the freezer, and then you just, it's really simple. You squish them. If they turn red, they drank. They, they, they were able to feed huh. through there. And so you can actually measure the feed rates. And we were able to reduce the number of feedings to, get to the textile like by a huge percentage. Um, like, so you, there's some great videos that will be out on March 7th on the web, website, but you can see like the squishing, you can see it all in content. If you go to Sika's website on that. Interesting. I, I I wondered I wondered how you would test. What, what are you gonna say, Carl? I'm not gonna be someone that stands there with the clothing on and testing it. If that's what you're about to uh, say. I just wanted to add something to what Chris was saying because we actually did get to use the prototypes of that uh, when we were in South Carolina in in August, and we were down there deer hunting slash hog hunting. Uh, we didn't do real good with the hunting, but I think probably because I was so entertained watching mosquitoes trying to bite through me. Uh, yeah, I was wearing one of, one of these prototypes with nothing, basically nothing underneath it. And I don't think on the trip I got one mosquito bite. And we were in, in the swamps in South Carolina, so there were plenty of mosquitoes to, if they wanted it. <laughs> yeah, and and so you bring, you both bring up a really good point. Like I know like uh, a photographer, for example, he had like a, a place that he would go like for an early season teal hunt and they would for and they would go down there. And he had done it so many years and he said he just turned into a giant welt. And so he almost didn't, you know, this is how he makes his living. He was like, I'm I almost didn't take the job anymore because it was so miserable. And then I gave him the prototypes to wear down there and he came with one bite on his elbow. Like, so I, I do know it works really well. We test it in the lab. And, and what you're talking about, Bo, is the reason we do the heated blood membrane is because exactly what you're talking about, like in order to in, take a human subject and put them in that, like the regulations you have to go through that, the safety protocols, you know, all of those things can be, you know, it has to be reviewed by a third party, like group that they have authorized you to go do that. So that's why we use the lab setting to validate it, but we're all going to be out hunting anyway. Yeah, We all know where we've had really bad situations. So we give people the hoodies, the, you know, these fill testers, and then they come back and we all have these stories about, how we know it's working in the field. And that's, that's how we, yeah. we validate both with the lab. We always use a lab and we always use field and you have to use the combination of the two. 
Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, I was just joking with you there, but like I've been, you know, I've been a part of the the testing process for a while for different things, and like, and you know, when it started with I, is the insect shield is in like the hanger shirt and pants too that we're having. I've worn those for for scouting for quite a few years, and I'd always laugh because like I'd go out shed hunting as it would get it would start to get hotter, and that's when the ticks really started to come out, and I could see because they were lighter colored clothing i'd always check and i'd rarely have any ticks even crawling on the on the the textiles or on the pants or on the shirt and i was just blown away by that and then once i got some of the the prototype turkey stuff here the equinox guard stuff last year and wore that out and was how everything just kind of like everything went together like inside the sleeves of the shirts that you could tuck them into the gloves. And then you had, you know, in, in the pants, you had the, the almost like, I don't know if you call it the gator. I'm not sure the technical terms for, but like basically like a very thin gator that tucks into your socks. So you don't have any skin exposure to it. And, and it was, it was pretty incredible to, to see how that worked from a mosquito standpoint, as well as ticks. Yeah. And, and you're kind of bringing up the two, like, so we do it in like really two ways. Like we we want to limit skin contact and we do that through a mechanical means. So the textile I was just talking about that we do with the blood membrane, that's a mechanical way of preventing them from contacting you. When we're talking about like the pant, the Equinox Guard pant, what Bo was referring to is there's an internal leg gator and the way that's designed, it's made out of the same material as that hoodie. And it's designed. So when you put on your pant, you then take your sock, so it's something we all are going to be wearing anyway. Roll it over that really lightweight textile that you can't even feel. And that way, if a tick or a chigger, specifically that that pant is really about, like I look at the hoodie and I think about mosquitoes. I look at the pant, I think about ticks and chiggers. And, and, really, and so if they come under the hem, they're going to hit that gator. And then the second mechanism that we're using or the second element that we use to prevent them is the permethrin. And we use uh, an insect shield process. So this is like, we don't treat the textile uh, at the textile level. We actually make the full garment and it goes through this really, really high temperature process uh, that, you know, you have to have really specialized textiles, anything that like you can't tape anything, it'll all come apart. You know, glues will come apart. It's that, that high temperature, but it infuses it for the life of the garment. So basically they, they say like regulations for like 75 washes, you know, they, they've done it out into the hundred, but the idea behind it is that mechanical means prevents them from contacting you. And then what they, if you go to the insect shield website, you'll see the drop away test. And what you were experienced with the ticks is say they, they get under there, they can't get to you. And then the permethrin takes effect and then they drop off. Yeah. Or if the mosquitoes on the hoodie, they're going to be like, I've got, I've watched them just probe around on my hand because on the glove, for example, we, we only use that textile on the back of the hand. That's where you take mosquito bites. I've watched the girls just going around like they're probing, trying to find it. and They can't get through. And eventually, you know, the permethrin is going to do its thing. And permethrin is really like it, it is extremely safe. It's like the lowest level like that. You can, you can put on a baby onesie if you want. That's what they so you know, so it's it's uh, so these are things that that you're doing to be able to prevent the the tick from contacting you, the chigger from contacting you. And then you guys were talking about don't bring them home. So one of the big things is I've done this before, got home and, you know, you have to do the tick check, but I've also found them in my hamper or on the floor crawling around because I took off my clothes and now I've brought a tick into my home and the permethrin will have them dropping away in most cases before you bring them home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that like when, with other clothes that if I get lazy with not treating clothes with permethrin or I don't do it at the beginning, like I'll come home and I'll end up like having it, I hang everything outside, like on a, lo- a clothesline basically, or, or in the basement or somewhere that's like separating it. Cause I was always worried about it, but it's been, it's been pretty crazy when you have something either treated or, you know, infused with like that insect shield that it, you really don't even have any that you can find crawling on you because it's used to be a game to see how many I could find, you know, crawling yeah, on me, which is, yeah, is scary. It's important to, yeah. And it's, it's not like, it's not a fun thing when you find one a couple of days later, cause you're no. like, Oh, I know that one's buried. And so then you start thinking about Lyme disease. So it's like, 
So when we were when we're doing this, and and I can't stress like to the people that are listening, like use the leg gaiters and use them properly. Like we made the sh- the hoodie with a very long tail so that you can tuck it in easily and it's never going to come untucked. These are like those are just two simple things that if you run them right, I feel very very confident telling you there's a very very tiny to almost nil chance you're going to ever have a tick on you that's actually going to get on your body. Um, so, you know, I've, I personally have had zero ticks and I've been using this for two years. I've never had that in my entire life. It's usually five or six a year. Yeah. So, um, so it's that, the, you know, this is something that I think that people can use and it's going to be, you know, something that really just makes, you don't have to think about like retreating, right. It's in there forever. And, um, you know, that you can, you can go ahead and just, continue to just use the the gear, take it out of the box and you don't have to spray yourself with something that has a scent. Uh, you don't have to worry about putting DEET on your body. Um, so th- th- that's really what we were trying to solve here. Yeah, it, it's because uh, that, that it does, if you do get lazy with it or like myself, you forget. I'm like, did I treat, th- when was the last time I treated this piece or doing it? That's normally what happens. I'm like, well, I, yeah, I'm not sure. And then you get the spray bottle out and it's about empty. It's like, well, <laughs> but, you know, having it built into it, like I said, I've had the, I think I've had the hanger stuff with the insect shield in it for, I don't know, three, four years now that that yep. stuff's been out. And, uh, I, I still haven't had any issues with it, um, with that, that many years of, of use within it. And, so how did was was Carl working with you on this project with the with the turkey line? Uh, yeah, I mean Carl works with me all the time, so for a lot of different things. But when we started, I mean Carl and I hang out a lot. So when we were talking <laughs> about this, and he was telling me through all this, and then I find out like he has a background in entomology. So I'm like, what don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, so you know. I've learned a lot from him because I kind of regurgitate a lot of the stuff, but then just hearing him talk now, I'm like, gosh, I know nothing. So compared to what all the things that he knows about uh, these, these uh, ticks and, and uh, mosquitoes and insects. Which, hey, Bo, that brings me up to a, a great segue for, from Chris. There is a resource that I would like to, you know, any of your listeners, if they're more interested in ticks and the tick-borne diseases and stuff like that, and what, you know, what what has changed and how they're treated and stuff like that, there is a publication that's put out that I think they they, they might want to have. Yep. Um, um, I don't have the URL for it, but it's just called uh, "Tick-Borne Diseases of the United States: A Reference Manual for Healthcare Providers," and it's put out by the CDC. You can just Google that and download it. It's for, uh, it's it's a PDF you can download, and it's got a lot of really good information on, on a lot of the different diseases uh, that you can that are available <laughs> that the ticks can carry. And yeah, actually, how some of how they're treated. Interesting. I have that wrote down. I'll put a link in the in the bottom of the the podcast here. Anybody that wants to look look for it and check it out, I'll put that in there. That's that would be a, a good resource to be able to check out. And um, so it, it's, I, I guess I should have assumed that uh, just about anything, even though Carl's retired from his his regular his regular job that he's that he's had. We'll, we'll call it that regular job through the times that uh, Chris wouldn't let him go from that standpoint. So so Carl, now you have to report to your wife and still report to Chris, right? Yeah, I, I report to Chris now. <laughs> Carl doesn't report to anybody. <laughs> Carl, Carl's just like, yeah, I like to work on the stuff I like to work on now. So. Yeah, yeah. That is exactly the point. He's giving me an opportunity to play. Yeah. <laughs> Without having to do the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you what, though, Bo, it, it has been a, a real treat working with Sitka for the last several years because when they do something, they do something right. And I am. I'm, I'm proud to be associated with them because there's not too many people out there I would have, have this kind of relationship with. Yeah, that's awesome. And Chris, Chris is definitely uh, one of those guys. As much as we uh, we like to beat on each other, I have to say he does a excellent job of what he does and seems to attract good people. So, well, we have got uh, just the 
good group of good field testers and like even people that are listening, a lot of times they don't know this, but they send this stuff into customer service and it makes it to me. The ideas do that yeah. people send. And sometimes I've even called, uh, you know, uh, like I had a consumer one time who was like, hey, on the lefty fanatic jacket, you should have had the waist zipper open from this way because I'm left handed. I'm like, oh my gosh. So we just like flipped around and made the future production with the, the left going the other way. Cause I, I, I just put it, you know, that one little zipper, the little details that having a, um, somebody come in. So it does, it does make it to me. And, um, uh, you know, <laughs> with all of these, these testers, we've got some great people that are constantly giving us good ideas. Like Bo and I worked on the cargo box. I've already got like 20 ideas on how I want to make it better in the future. So same. I know he does too. <laughs> <laughs> it's always ever evolving, but so, so talk a little bit more about the Equinox Guard, Chris, and, and, you know, kind of what, what's this, this product line look like? Cause I feel like it, uh, definitely, uh, turned some heads, you know, from the, from the garments down to the, the new vest as well. Yeah. So, um, the Equinox Guard is, it's really just three products. It's, it's, it's a, the hoodie, it's a glove. And it's the pant. So the pant, I really look at, and again, tick and chigger protection with the internal gaiter. But the, the pant main body material is like a raised grid pattern on the inside. So that promotes airflow. And then it has some side leg pocket vents. Um, and then there's a separate knife pocket, you know. So I have a cracked phone on my screen right now because I was wearing a pant the other day. And uh, didn't have my didn't have that separate pocket, and I had my knife in there, and I took a tree stand down and uh, cracked my phone screen. Yep, just like that. Yep. And I was like, <laughs> if I had just been wearing the right pair of pants, that <laughs> that would have been better. Um, so, and then, uh, and then you know, so that's really what the pant does, you know. And then a hoodie, like I said, has a long tail to tuck into the pant, and then the material on the main body of the the hoodie is that that mosquito bite resistant textile. Like I said, it's super lightweight. You're going to pick this up, I guarantee, and be like, no way is this going to stop them from being able to bite through it. And, and, and it will. Um, and then, uh, you know, it has a hood. So the one thing I'll say is you put the hood up. I'm wearing my, you know, I'm wearing that over my ears. The one thing that I'll say is like, you're still going to hear them going around your ears trying to get there you you're gonna have to it's a mental game that's the hardest part is they're not actually gonna you know it's it, you're you're actually protected there and then it's got a face mask for concealment that's really breathable and then the glove you know has a really long gauntlet so you never get wrist exposure the that bite resistant textiles on the back of the hand and then in the four shets, which are the areas between your fingers for people that don't know what that is that's the four shets. And your fingertips are out of a nylon cordura. And so if you're like screwing in tree stand hooks, you know, or uh, hooks for your bag, stuff like that. I know in PA, nobody's supposed to do that. But, um, you know, you're, scre you're screwing in the, the hooks to hang your bag on or whatever. And you're manipulating against a tree. You're not going to wear your fingertips out. And then the palm is an axe suede material, which is a super, super durable material. And the, the thumb and the finger are exposed um, just for, you know, people that want to be able to fill their trigger or their release. Um, so those are, those are the Equinox guard. That's the peril portion of what's coming out on the seventh. Well, um, I, I do want to mention before you transition, Chris, about the, the pants. One of the things that, that I thought was really cool about it is the side zips that they have the vent also are just, they're also mesh that's inside. So it's not like you still, you're not defeating the purpose by allowing bugs and everything else to transfer onto your skin underneath. And I mean, I, I wore those pants in, in Turkey season, like they were designed for, but I also wore them when I was in West Virginia, uh, whitetail hunting when it got to like 70 some degrees and it was hot and a new ticks were going to be out and we were doing spot and stock type stuff. And we were on the ground and I, I wore those pants at that point and as I was moving I was able to vent and be able to dump heat um, even though they are a lightweight material I was able to dump heat but not having the the exposure I guess of being able to have those little those little uh, insects crawling into to uh, latch onto your skin so that was just yeah, something I wanted to add 
Yeah, that's a good point. I sometimes forget. And then also the hoodie is UPF 50 plus protection. So uh, that's the highest rating you can get for UPF is 50. Um, and, so the, 50 and the hood plus. goes over top. Of, you can go over the brim of your hat too, right? Yeah, it's super stretchy. So it, yeah, is that what it's meant to do? Or is I just, yeah. was that was, I was just doing that? <laughs> yeah, no, I actually, a lot of people do that. I'll do it too. Yeah. And, and like I said, you'll find this material. It'll stretch for days. And that's part of the way it works. We had to develop that special textile to have that because all of those things work to stop the proboscis from getting through. Um, and yeah, so th those those are some of the, the features of that. And then for, you know, this is like, I mean, if you're moose hunting, spring bear, turkey, early teal, you know, all of those things. So it's actually going to be available in subalpine. Uh, that, which is, you know, kind of a, like a, a bright, like grass greens, you know, early season, great condition for that. Uh, it's in timber, which is for very dark conditions. Um, and then it's also available in elevated two for early season whitetail. So you'll actually have three patterns. So you can pick uh, which, uh, which patterns right for you with this. So it, it, uh, it works for a, a multitude of pursuits as, as long as there are hot weather and buggy they'll be good for it. Huh. Oh, I, I didn't realize that uh, the elevated two is going to be in the mix too. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, uh, and then something new that's coming out. I didn't work on it personally. I did get to field test it and have some input on it. Um, but it is the, uh, the Equinox Turkey vest, my, uh, my counterpart at work. There it is. Yep. Bo's got his holding up. Uh, and it, you know, this is a running gun style. So the Equinox guards really built for mobile and comfort. This this thing is almost like a pack concept, but like in a turkey vest, like it has like the structure of like the shoulder straps of a pack. Super comfortable if you're leaning against a tree. Uh, it has like a double pot call holder. You know, we worked with like a lot of guys that like like Hudnall, like Todd Rathbun, like uh, David Halloran. You know, uh, um, uh, John Mulligan that does bourbon barrel calls like like these guys that build turkey calls. And we actually worked with them. There are some of the field testers, too, for this that were running this. So it's got a, a great magnetic closure for putting two pot calls. You can put your your mouth calls inside of there. Um, multiple areas for strikers, a box call that like is a water resistant or waterproof Gore-Tex actually pocket that keeps your box call really dry and keeps it from making noise. Um, and then, you know, a way to be able to put hydration ports in the back or a hydration bladder, like everything that you would think, like if you are really technical, big game hunter, taking that kind of thought and throwing it into a, a running gun style Turkey vest with a, with a great seat that just like disappears on you. And then, you know, there's some good videos on how to use that and that drops down and it's super easy to use and super comfortable. Yeah, and you know it's it's funny. Like I I was I was saying it a few years ago. Like I was like, why is is there I I cannot find a turkey vest that actually like doesn't like isn't so baggy that when I'm like trying to move quickly that it's just like slapping around and all the calls are are hitting off me and and you know do that. I'm sure I'm sure you know you've run into that before too and obviously with the design, but it's like like you said, it almost has like that athletic fit to like um some of the big game packs or something that just like has a little bit of padding in the back and the shoulder straps but everything just like fits good and fits to you where it's not baggy and flopping around it has a little bit of structure to it um having that hydration uh port in the back is super nice uh having the the stuff sack basically in the back of it so you can put your layers in there so like for me if i'm um you know in, in pennsylvania early in the in the spring in the mornings it might even be close to freezing sometimes at at first light and then by the time it's 11 a.m it's 70 degrees you know and so you're shedding layers and being able to throw that off and stuff it in and cinch it down um is is all and also having a little orange uh little orange p thing to be able to pull out on the back and throw over the the back of your pack in case uh in case you have a turkey thrown on on there and uh if you're in pennsylvania you want to throw as much orange on as you can as you're walking out of the woods with with a turkey uh, yeah right, right carl <laughs> <laughs> 
Fact, right. even, in, even in my private land uh, uh, where I grew up, I've, I've caught two poachers during turkey season uh, on my own, own property. One year I, I heard a shot in my place in uh, Alabama, I went back around and, and uh, came walking there. And there was this high school kid came walking up and uh, had a, <laughs> a, a back. I was like, yeah, I'll take that. Let's go. And then another time my wife and I were driving, we were going out the turkey hunt and we, we could look up a power line on the hunting lease that we had in South Carolina. And I was like, Oh, there's, there's hens out in the field. And we sat there and looked and I was like, that hen has not moved in <laughs> five minutes. I was like, that is a decoy and nobody's out there. So I, I walked out there and again, high school kids come walking out of the woods. And he's like, he, I'm like, Hey, uh, you've, uh, you're on my property. He was like, yeah, I know. He was like, you want me to call my buddies? They just shot a Drake up there. I was like, all right, Jake up there. I was like, yeah, call him on down. <laughs> so, <laughs> got three poachers on my on my property. And, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. oh, he, ratted, he ratted on his buddies. <laughs> oh, he called them. These guys come walking up. They have a Jake that they just shot that morning. I was like, oh, God. Yeah, instead of just saying, yeah, we'll get out of here and like texting his buddy, like, you know, go around the other side of the mountain. He's like, oh, yeah, my buddies just shot Jake up there. We'll call him down. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. That kid's dad showed up and he started showing me pictures of deer that he'd shot off the place that I leased. I was like looking at the game board and I was like, can't you do anything about this? He was like, nope. Oh, so. that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but back to, back to the, the vest a, a little bit there. But yeah, the orange the orange things, I think that's a, that's a nice added feature. But I, I just, I don't know. The, the thing that, that I was so excited about with it and is that it has... It does have enough storage that like it, you can carry stuff. And for me, I, you know, I'm, I'm a person that does take more into the field a lot of times than maybe some do, but it still has that minimalist feel to it that it's not like overbearing, but it has enough that you can store extra layers. You want to put some snacks in the back, which I like to carry some snacks, you know, I'm turkey hunting and, uh, the water bladder and then all your calls on the front end and keeping that tight to you. I mean, mine's my, pe my, uh, vest is still fully loaded from last year. Cause I just leave everything in its, in its pockets and hang it up. But, uh, it, I, I just like the, the fit and feel of it. It just felt like it was, was, uh, designed for it. And it just blows, blows my mind that it was taking this long for something like that to come out. <laughs> yeah, I, Jim did a great job on it. I'm yeah, I'm super impressed with how well the design came out. Yeah, no, it uh, it turned turned out really really well, and I um, so with with the turkey vest, it's kind of funny. Like, I I feel like even though it's not really designed for any of that, like for like ground hunting and whitetails and stuff, like I've I've messed around with it. I I you know not. It's designed for turkeys, but uh, it's it's worked out well. Besides the pothole holder, don't really have a need for that. But everything else is uh, it's been kind of a lightweight run and gun style style setup there. So you're saying in the box coal holder, you're just going to pull out a very fat grunt, grunt tube, tube yeah. On it. <laughs> no, <that's right>. Yeah. <laughs> so finding new ways to use new things. Yep. You know. You know. I can always come up with something, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so this so as this podcast releases it uh the stuff will have come out um the day before i guess because uh march 7th is a release and march 8th is when this podcast will all drop so that'll be just about perfect yeah and uh and you know anybody that has any questions feel free to go to the sicka website there's tons of videos and content on the, the guard, it'll be up there or, you know, contact our customer service team. I, I still say we have the best customer service team out there. If you, if you call them, they, they'll definitely try and help you understand everything you need to know about the product. So then they all hunt. So yeah, yeah they, they, they're legitimate hunters. In there. <laughs> I would agree. It's nice to be able to call and get somebody real on the phone and be able to talk to them and, and, uh, have a conversation with them. I, I remember when I've called before, it's uh, been one of those situations where it ends up just turning into a, a hunting conversation sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And uh, Carl, I appreciate uh, you sharing your knowledge. Is there anything else that you wanted to add on there that you've been stewing on while you've been sitting there listening to Chris, you know, babble over there? 
Babel is the right word. <laughs> it's, you know, every, everybody kind of nerds out on something. When Sir, Chris starts talking about some of their products, he kind of nerds out on those things as well. And and it, it's fascinating to actually, I, I learned from him basically on some of the background on how these 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 things are put together. And just hearing the attention to detail that put, that Sitka puts into everything they produce is just, that's just neat. Yeah. No, it is. I, I, I've enjoyed working with Chris on things and his thought process, uh, through, through the years here. It's been, it's been fun watching, uh, watching his attention to detail and his thought process behind him and getting to hunt with him and seeing how he's testing things. And I'm like, man, it's crazy. It's not like that folks. Uh, Bo just sits there and gives me a hard time the whole time and I just give it right back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. In reality, we just, we just uh, go back and forth most of the time. A little bit of work's done, but most of it's just <laughs> bashing each other. <laughs> when work's done, it's good. Yeah. So. <laughs> Definitely. Well, cool. Thank you guys for uh, thank you guys for coming on. I appreciate it. Check out everything on um, the new turkey hunting stuff on the Sick Gear website. Check out the link Carl talked about on the as far as tick-borne illnesses that the CDC puts out that PDF there. So I'll. Put a link down to below and uh yeah thank you guys i really appreciate it thanks for having us on yeah it's been fun thanks so much for listening to this episode of east meets west hunt with your host bo martonic for more great content and to stay up to date visit east meets west hunt.com facebook at east meets west outdoors and instagram at east meets west hunt if you enjoyed today's episode please review and subscribe and we'll catch you next time